Today we have Bill who's going to teach us about half cents. Um, if you have any questions for this one, you can put them in the Q&A in the chat and I will uh, stop Mr. Eckberg and ask <laughs> him the question and then we'll move on. Um, but we're really excited to hear from Bill and go ahead and give it a, give it a go. Well, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about half cents and uh, I'll go right directly to the first slide. One of the people asked a little bit about what half cents are and, and why we had them, how were they made, what were their designs, who designed them, how rare are they and what are they worth and how do we collect them. We're going to talk about all these things in here and we'll start at the beginning uh, with what are half cents and then sort of go down this list. And uh, as I said, if you're interested in asking questions, feel free to do that. Um, I'm not intimidated by that kind of thing. I have been collecting half cents for about 30 years and uh, studying them seriously for almost all that time. Um, and uh, I've learned a number of things that people didn't know before. And I'm going to share some of those things with you. Uh, you will find out that some of the information in all of the books is wrong. Um, we shouldn't be surprised at that because a lot of times, particularly in numismatics, people publish opinions and then the next person that copies that opinion uh, reports it as a fact. And then for generations after that, it becomes truth. Even though it wasn't originally published as a fact, it was published as an opinion. Um, people begin to think that things are true. And so we have to approach everything with a fresh eye and, uh, and pay attention to uh, uh, questions that people did not know. So what is a half cent? It's a US coin minted between 1793 and 1857. Uh, they were made from pure copper. They were about the size of today's quarter dollar and their buying power was just about the same as 14 cents today so uh, if you would stoop down to pick up a dime on the floor, you would definitely have uh, picked up a half cent back when they were made. Um, a lot of people won't pick up a, a cent on the ground, I will, but a lot of people won't do that today, but I think almost everybody will pick up a dime, and or at least I very rarely find them. And uh, so they actually had buying power. And we wanna keep in mind that they were the money of real people. So they circulated widely. Um, bust half dollars generally didn't circulate in commerce and just moved from bank to bank. Uh, they were used uh, to back the specie that the banks, or the, the paper money that the banks produced and to back loans that the banks made. So they just shipped bags of, of half dollars from bank to bank. That's why you can get uh, a lot of bust half dollars in very high grade today because they never circulated. A few silver dollars or gold coins were produced in those days and they didn't circulate in this country either. Most of the gold coins uh, went overseas and were melted and most of the dollars uh, were sent to the Caribbean where they uh, were used in trade there. A few of them went to uh, China and so on, but they really didn't circulate in this country. Most of them were struck during the presidencies of Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. How much more historical can you get than that? Uh, nearly half of them were struck during Jefferson's presidency. So if coin collecting is history in your hands, these are real history in your hands. Very fascinating. So why such an odd denomination? Why did they make a half cent? The reason is that um, the uh, US economy was originally based on the Spanish dollar, uh, which was, uh, and, and there's a Spanish dollar in the lower right of your screen, an eight real coin. Uh, that was the unit of account for the US. So that's why we have the dollar. And those were often cut into halves, quarters, and eighths or bits. And you see a quarter of a Spanish dollar uh, to the right, and then an eighth or a bit also called a piece of eight, if you're familiar with that term. Um, and of course, a piece of eight or an eighth of a dollar was 12 and a half cents 
So a bit was 12 and a half cents and half cents were needed to make change. Cents and half cents resembled the British coppers that were already in circulation in size and to some extent also in uh, look. Um, you might think that the penny was, the British penny was, was like the cent, but it was not. The British penny in copper was not made until 1797. Earlier pennies were made out of silver. So the cent is not patterned after the penny the cent is actually patterned after the half penny or halfpenny. Uh, those were 29 millimeters in diameter, 9.9 .9 grams, slightly smaller, but close in size to a US large cent, the cent of the time. The farthing, a quarter of a penny, was 23 millimeters in diameter, 4.9 grams, close in size to a US half cent, but all half cents were a little bit heavier. The uh, coin at the bottom of your screen is a uh, King George farthing. On the obverse, it has the portrait of the king wearing a laurel wreath and in Roman armor. And his name, of course, Georgius Rex is in Latin, all to give him great import and power. On the back, we have the figure of Britannia seated on the globe because Britannia rules the globe. Uh, sitting next to her is a shield with the Union Jack. Uh, she's carrying, holding a staff in her left hand and a plant of some kind in her right hand. And I don't recall what kind of plant that is. And it says Britannia around her. And underneath her is the date of that coin, which is 1774. And look for a second at the one and you see it looks like a J. And that was characteristic of British coins at the time. So Articles of Confederation were the first US government. That was a league of friendship between sovereign states. And by that, I mean that the Congress or the central government was not sovereign. The states were sovereign and the Articles of Confederation said that they were friends with each other and the league of friendship is actually taken from the document. It was ratified excuse me, March 1, 1781. We were still at war with the British. Um, the Articles of Confederation did not work because the central government was essentially ineffective because it could not tax. It could only ask the states for money. Imagine if uh, the federal government today could only ask the states for money. We would have no federal government at all. Um, it was replaced by the Constitution which is still in effect, though some are trying to change that, in 1789. And we have had the same constitution and the same government since 1789. Um, there were a couple of elements of the Articles of, Con of, of Confederation that are relevant to this. The top quote, the United States in Congress assembled shall also have the sole and exclusive right and power of regulating the alloy and value of coins struck by their own authority or by that of the respective states. That means that, first of all, either Congress could have uh, money coined or the individual states could have money coined. But if they did, they were supposed to follow the same standards that Congress established. And Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Connecticut all coined coppers. Uh, during the Articles of Confederation, as did Vermont, which was not a part of the Confederation. Vermont at that time was an independent country. And uh, as you'll see, it wanted to be a state. Congress did order the striking of some coins called Fujio coppers, also called Franklin cents, for reasons which you will see in a minute. None of these were made to any European standard and it's important to understand that, except for the Massachusetts uh, coins, all of them were coined by uh, people who, uh, who were uh, doing it for profit. Even the ones that were uh, struck for Congress, the Fujio coppers, were made by someone for profit, not for profit to the government. As you might guess, 
uh, there was lots of uh, bad behavior by the people involved in making these. Uh, only Massachusetts created a half cent that was supposed to adhere to the standards established by Congress. And that was, it was supposed to weigh 78 and three quarters grains or 5.1 grams. Notice that's two tenths of a gram heavier than the British farthing. And this is a picture of the very first United States quote unquote half cent. Um, it's actually called a five. If you look on the left side under the US, um, there's a dot, dot, dot five. This was coin was to be five units of a silver coin that was a thousand units. Notice that the one and the date is a J like the British had. Um, notice there's a little wreath and you'll see wreaths in a lot of the coins we're gonna look at later. Notice the obverse says libertas and justicia, liberty and justice. And on the back, nova constellatio, a new constellation. There are 13 stars surrounding a glory, the rays, and that surrounds the all seeing eye. This was made by uh, Benjamin Dudley for Robert Morris as a pattern. It was made for, for Congress in other words. As far as we know, it's the only one that was made uh, none were released into circulation. This was discovered in England in 1977. Very important early American coin. Um, in 1786, you don't have to read this, an ordinance for the establishment of the mint of the United States of America and for regulating the value and alloy of coin. This was uh, Congress's attempt to establish a mint um, it didn't work. Congress never did establish a mint, but they at least passed a, uh, an ordinance allowing them to do so. And here's a Fujio copper. These are fascinating little coins. Um, the obverse, which is on the left, you have a sun at the top with a, with a face. I didn't know that the sun had a face, but he's surrounded by a glory of rays that are shining down on a sundial with the numbers one through 12, with the 12 hours. On the left, it says Fugio, which is Latin for I fly. And so you're looking at uh, the sundial, which symbolizes time, time flies. And on the right side, it says the date 1787. And on the bottom, it says, mind your business. Now, mind your business does not mean what it would mean to us today. We, means to us today, it means pay, uh, don't, pay, don't get in anybody else's business. Just, just mind your own, mind your own business. Uh, back then, what it meant was take care of your business affairs, pay attention to your own business. Uh, if you've ridden in, on the subway in London, every time the doors are gonna close, they say, mind the gap, pay attention to the gap so you don't fall. This mind means about the same thing. So time flies, so pay attention to your business. On the reverse, there are 13 rings all joined together, surrounding another ring that's in this case says States United, other uh, varieties say United States, and one really rare one says American Congress. And on the inside, it says we are one, uh, implying that all of the states are united. Um, well, they really weren't. Uh, these, as I said, were made on a contract. What you're looking at here on the left is Benjamin Franklin's original design. This is actually from Benjamin Franklin's notebook and the layout is in his own hand. He used a compass and protractor and laid out the design that was used for these. He didn't lay out the design for the, uh, the scent, for the Fujio scent, but he laid it out for a, a continental uh, a paper money piece, which you see in the middle, one sixth of a dollar. And you notice that each ring has the name of the state with beginning at New Hampshire at the top and then going clockwise around as you go further south and then you end up at Georgia. And, and on the inside, 
it says American Congress and we are one. And then another picture of the uh, Fujio Center or, or the Franklin Center, the Fujio Copper, just to show you um, how that looked. This is a picture of a gentleman named William Dewar. Um, he is responsible for much that happened badly with the uh, Fujio Coppers. He uh, was a businessman and speculator, a member of the Continental Congress who accepted a $10,000 bribe to give the contract for Fujio Coppers to James Jarvis. He then remarkably became Assistant Secretary of the Treasury to Alexander Hamilton, continued to speculate and his speculation destroyed his and many other fortunes in 1792. He died in 1799, spending the last few years of his life in debtor's prison. Here's a Massachusetts half cent on the obverse, or at least what I call the obverse, a Native American with a bow and arrow and the word commonwealth surrounding him. On the reverse, a spread eagle with the the sh a shield and the word half cent um, over his abdomen, a pair of wings, the word Massachusetts surrounding him, and in his uh, left talon, the right one as we look at it, because we're looking at his abdomen, a bunch of arrows, and in his right talon, an olive branch, and his head is looking at that. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. This is a Vermont copper. Uh, Vermont coppers were of two types, and we'll show you the other type in a moment. This shows the sun peeking up over the mountains, a bunch of trees, one of which at least is floating in the air, a plow underneath, Vermontensium res publica, uh, by the authority of the uh, public of Vermont, the people of Vermont, and on the back, Stella Quarta Decima, the 14th star. Vermont wanted to be the 14th state uh, in the United States. We have that all seeing eye again. Um, kind of a neat coin. These are really quite rare, especially one like this. Uh, this, by the way, um, if you look, you see there's little flaws in the coin and there were in the uh, Fujio as well. Those are characteristic of these coins. They were all, the copper wasn't of high quality and so there were lots of inclusions. Here's another Vermont copper. This looks like a, a British halfpenny. It says, except it says instead of uh, George III, it says Vermont Octori, again by the authority of Vermont. And on the back, instead of Britannia, it says India Lib, Independence and Liberty. But the figure on the back looks a lot like Britannia. In this case, she's even got a Union Jack next to her sitting on a globe. And on the obverse, again, it looks like King George got the laurel wreath and the, and the armor and so on. The idea was that if these coins looked like uh, British half pennies, they would be accepted in com commerce more readily. And uh, you might wonder, what grade this coin is in. This particular one is actually uh, in about uncirculated condition. The obverse head was punched too deeply in the die and so the reverse didn't strike up at all. Amazing. Here's a Connecticut copper, up Tory Connect, by the authority of Connecticut, independence and liberty again. Um, similar kinds of thing. Really pretty primitive looking coin. And here's a New Jersey. They were quite different. Had a horse and a plow, Nova Caesarea, which is Latin for New Jersey. And on the back, a shield and the words e pluribus unum, out of many one. And that was the first appearance of our national motto on a coin. What looks like the horse's bridle or um, he's drooling or something is actually a die break. The problem with all these was counterfeits. The uh, 
people that made the coins uh, for, uh, for the uh, governments um, and some other people as well had a booming business in producing counterfeit uh, British half pennies at the top and state coppers at the bottom. Um, these were made lightweight, so they uh, uh, were uh, used less metal than they should have had. Hmm. You'd think somebody that taught college could get through a lecture without coffee. But I had that problem then too. Anyway, uh, even the Massachusetts uh, scent down at the bottom looks like a good one, but because of the uh, lettering and the numbers, we know that this was made by one of the counterfeiters. The same guy that made the other three actually. So the counterfeits had a very important effect. By 1789, there were so many of them in circulation that nobody believed they were worth anything. Of course, they weren't. And even the real coppers lost their value and this caused an economic depression. Well, what else happened in 1789? We already talked about it. That was the year that the, uh, uh, the constitution went into effect and our current government came into existence. You would think that uh, one of the first orders of business for the new government would have been to try to rectify that by making real coins. But of course it didn't. The Mint Act was not produced, uh, was not authorized until April of 1792. And here's a copy of it, or at least the beginning of it. I'm really sorry about the coffee. And here section nine and be it further enacted that there be from time to time struck and coined at the said mint coins of gold, silver, and copper of the following denominations, cents each to be of the value of one hundredth part of a dollar and to contain 11 penny weights of copper, half cents each to be of the value of half a cent and to contain five penny weights and half a penny weight of copper. In 1792, they actually made a coin to that standard this is this famous birch scent. We don't really know who made it. The reason it's called birch scent is because on the shoulder of Liberty, the name birch appears. So we assume that's the person who uh, engraved it. The inscription reads Liberty, parent of science and industry, the date 1792. A not terribly good uh, picture of somebody on the obverse. The reverse. Uh, has a, a wreath with a single bow inside it, the denomination, one cent. Below that, the denomination is one one hundredth of a dollar. And surrounding that, United States of America. And that was what was supposed to be on these coins. There was another one made because the copper cent was thought to be too heavy. Um, the cheap coiner had the bright idea of making a coin that was uh, one quarter of a cent worth of copper and three quarters of a cent worth of silver in the middle. And it was this size relative to the other one, much smaller, now large it so you can see it better. The same inscriptions, Liberty Parent of Science and Indust, because there wasn't room for the RY, the date, the single bow wreath, the denomination, United States of America. This is the famous silver center set. Absolutely amazing coin. They amended the act in January of 1793 to lower the weight of the cent and the half cent. And then they started making real coins. Cents were made at the new standard, about 20% lighter than, than the original standard. Chain cents made from late February to mid-March. Wreath cents from April till early July. Liberty cap cents from July through 1795. All again at the same weight standard. And actually half cents were made at that standard as well, 104 grains. And here's the 1793, 
that we know was actually made on July 24th, 1793. It's amazing that we can tell that. Um, I won't go into why we know that, but, uh, but we do. July 24th, 1793, that coin was made. This was made in the summer of 1794, a different design, and I'll talk about these different designs in a minute. 1795. And then at the end of December of 1795, President Washington ordered a further decrease in weight of the cent and half cent. Half cent was to be uh, 3.5 penny weights or 84 grains, and all subsequent half cents were at this weight. So let's talk about what half cents look like. This is going to be a half cent typeset. We'll look at the obverses first and then the reverses. The 1793 was designed and engraved by Henry Voigt. Uh, he was not an engraver, he was actually the temporary chief coiner. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the powers that be, Jefferson and Washington, were trying to hire someone from Europe to be the chief coiner and chief engraver at one salary. In 1793, they had somebody to do that, but they didn't stick with it. The end of uh, 1793, they hired Robert Scott as engraver, and he designed this half set in 1794. And he designed this one in 1795. These are all Liberty caps, but you can see that they're all quite different from one another. He designed this one in 1800. It copied the uh, large cent from 1796 and even the dollar from 1795. He co uh, created this one in uh, 1809. Um, a new variety. This is usually credited to uh, someone else, but, but it's certain that Scott was the designer. We have a question if you're... Oh, sure. Uh, the Liberty Cap device is borrowed from France, correct? Actually, they go back to Rome. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's actually originally a Roman design. When somebody was freed from slavery, uh, they were given that cap to wear it's called a Peleus in uh, Latin, and it really goes back a lot further than France. But much of our system was adopted from France because Jefferson was a great lover of France, and he was the Secretary of State, and the Mint was under the Secretary of State at the time. Um, the last design was by Christian Gobrecht. Um, I'm showing the last year that they were made instead of the first year of the design. Um, just to show you the full period during which half cents were made, 1793 to 1857. All of these coins, by the way, are from the uh, famous Missouri cabinet, the uh, only complete collection of US half cents ever sold and by far the finest collection um, ever put together. So here's the uh, reverse from 1793, also by Henry Boyd. Here's a reverse from 1794 that was by uh, Robert Scott. And we'll talk a little bit about this reverse in a minute um, because this reverse was done from a complete hub. And I'll explain what hubs are in a moment. The entire design, the letters, the, the leaves, the, the numbers, and even the dentals around the outside were in uh, the, the hub that produced the dye. Uh, that didn't work very well. Um, and later in the year, they did this one, which uh, could have been by John Smith Gardner, who was Scott's assistant. But it's based on a design by Henry Voigt from the year before. This one uh, definitely was a design by Gardner. And this one, again, is Gardner, even though he didn't work at the Mint in 1800. Um, it's still his design. 
But I'm going to show you a couple of other reverses that were used with that Drake bus. This one, um, if you're a specialist, you know, is probably from either 1803 or 1804, because that's when this die was used. I'm illustrating it to show this large crack that goes th from the T in the states, second T through the F and half, and then really all the way to the rim on the other side. Badly damaged die, but it was continued in use for a long time. They made a lot of coins from this. This is another uh, die that was used with Drake busts. Uh, this shows even more damage. If you look over the word America, you see a huge series of cuts that came out of the die there. And below 200 and, under, and over uni, Again, more cuts. This die made many thousands of coins while it was in bad shape like this. Uh, you wonder why they kept making them like that, but they did. This reverse was probably designed by John Reich. He's the person that people usually credit for the obverse, but there's absolutely no evidence that he designed the obverse. There is evidence that he designed the reverse a different type of wreath, a single wreath, completely different from those before. And then that was adapted by Gobrecht for the last type. So that's a type set. How were half sets made? Um, oops, too far, let me go back. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the right side, you see the coin. Um, just to the left of it, you see the working die. To the left of that, you see the hub. And then finally, on the far left, you see the master die. The master die is engraved below the surface. So the image there is in, in cous or in taglio, if you wish. And uh, that's engraved into soft steel. The steel is then hardened and another piece of soft steel is impressed into it to raise a hub, so the hub has a, a raised design on it. You can harden the hub and then use it to make a new master die or to make a working die. The working die then has some other things done to it. There's going to be a center dot uh, for a compass to inscribe guidelines, and you can see the guidelines and those were used for uh, placing the date and the text. And then they were polished off before the die was used to strike coins. It's important to understand this so that you understand um, how coins were made. And in fact, this is pretty much how we do it today, except the master dies are usually made uh, by computers now. So how many were made? The total mintage for the entire period was just under 8 million. Um, that's a lot fewer coins than the Philadelphia Mint, fewer cents than the Philadelphia Mint makes in a couple of hours today. The largest mintages were in 1804 and 1809 with over a million each. The smallest mintage was for those dated 1796. The Red Book and all the other books say the Mint made 1,390 uh, half cents that year, but the actual mintage was 6,480. And if you get Coin World, the February issue of Coin World had an article that I wrote um, explaining that, but I'm going to uh, give you a little bit more information. Hundred nine thousand coins were delivered in the first quarter of 1796. 5,090 in the second quarter, and 1,390 in the last quarter. And that total was what was put in the, uh, the Red Book for a long time as the mintage for 1796. But that can't possibly be right. There are two varieties for that year, one with no pole, and you see two big cracks across it that almost meet in the middle. There are about 30 of those. And a variety with the pole, and there are about 110 of those. These two coins, again, are from the Missouri cabinet. 
So 140 total surviving uh, 1796 half cents. 140 total survivors out of 1,390 would mean 10% of the mintage survived. But there is no half cent type that survives that much. And in fact, about 1.5% of the Liberty Caps survive. If we divide 140 by 1.5%, suggest something like 9,000 were made. Um, 9,000 would be a more likely mintage than 1,390, and 6,480 is a lot closer to that than 1,390. No pole coins are 21% of the survivors, and 1,390 happens to be 21% of 6,480. So it is almost certain the mint, by the way, could strike about 1,390 coins in an hour. And why would they use that cracked and incomplete die if the good one with a pole were available? They simply wouldn't. So here are the coins, the no pole mintage 1390, with pole mintage 5090, total mintage 6480, of which about 2%, uh, 2.2% 2 2 survived today. Now I just told you, that 1.5% of the type survive, but now I'm telling you 2%. Why do more than 1.5% survive? It's because of this coin. People exchanged their old large copper cents and half cents for these at the mint in 1857. And amazingly, the mint let local coin dealers in Philadelphia go through all of those large cents and half cents and colonial coins and pull out ones that they thought they could make money off of. I love the way uh, Frossard wrote this. During the last, this was in 17, 1876. During the last 15 years, the vein of collecting coins has greatly increased in the United States. Before that time, there were collectors, men of note, perseverance, and genius, like Dr. Montrose W. Dixon, Edward Maris, J.J. Nickley, and a few others whose opportunities for collecting the various issues of colonial and old mint pieces have not since been equal. Had it not been for the spirit of research of these gentlemen at a time when old American coins were sent to the United States mint for recoinage by the thousand, many rare varieties would have been utterly lost to us. Uh, it was such a wonderful thing that the, that the uh, mint supported their businesses, uh, but they did. And it's a good thing for us because if it hadn't, it would be almost impossible for us to collect these coins. Probably fewer than 250,000 half cents survive of all dates combined. That's a very small number. As a denomination, they are probably scarcer than 1909 SVDB cents. The most common half cent is rarer than the 1877 Indian head or the 1893 S. Morgan. Here's an example of the most common half cent. 1804 plain four without stems. About 8,000 of them are known, about $400 in XF, which is what this coin is approximately, less than a 1909 SPDB and good. Here's your 1893 S Morgan. 9,000 of them or more are in slabs. A XF is 20,000. This one is not an XF, it's a BG but even in VG, 3,000, a lot more than a half cent. Uh, 1877 Indian, 10,000 plus slabbed by PCGS and NGC, $500 in good, 2,000 in XF. Again, a lot more expensive than a nice half cent. Half cents are a relative bargain. So let's talk about some interesting half cents. There are two that have sold for a million dollars. This was the first one, uh, 1794, red brown color. It was graded uh, mid state 67 red brown by PCGS. I think that was a generous grade, but hey, there aren't any others that are this nice. It's a beautiful, beautiful coin. And this one, 1811. Uh, sold for just over a million dollars. Um, it's sold twice since then, both times for less money. The last time 
significantly less. Here's some more affordable half cents, ones that you might actually collect yourself. A really nice choice on circulated, nearly 200 years old for about 500 bucks. Really pretty piece. Or this lovely XF for $100. If $100 is too much for, or a very good Drake bust from 1800 for $100. If, if uh, $100 is too much for you, you can get some uh, nice half cent or some half cents for 50 bucks. This would be a late date. You could not get this one for 50 bucks because this one happens to be a circulated proof. Um, but if you had a late date in that condition, that's about what it would cost, about 50 bucks. Or this, a fine uh, middle date, classic head. Or even a you know good to very good, I probably guess I'd call this a good uh, drape bust. If you can go to $100, you can get a late date in AU like this one, nice lustrous AU. A nice XF, basically full detailed um, classic head, middle day. A BG drape bust. Not this one, because this happens to be a rare one. But one in comparable condition. If you can spend 250 bucks, you can get an uncirculated late day, like this one. Or an AU middle day. It's got a lot of luster left. Uh, fine to very fine uh, uh, drape bust. And if you're not particular about condition for 250 bucks, you can even get a Liberty cap. Uh, this one's in pretty low grade, but it's a real Liberty cap from the 1700s, 250 bucks. If you can spend a thousand, you can get some drape busts in uncirculated condition. Probably not this particular one, but you can get other drape busts in uncirculated condition. You can get Liberty caps in fine to very fine. This is a 1795. And this one, this is a 1793 that actually sold last year for just about $1,000. It's pretty low grade, but this is actually one of the very first half cents that were produced the first day they made half cents. And you can tell because on the back, if you look from about one to 230 on the rim, you can see there's a rim cut there. And from that, you can identify the variety. And we know that that was the very first variety of half cent that was made. Again, it's not pretty to look at, but it is a 1790 uh, 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 three half cent. Let's talk for a minute about how the 1793s were made. I'm gonna to try to go through this quickly. There were two dies. Uh, everybody thought they were individually hand engraved until about four years ago. When, when I discovered that if you overlay them, you find the faces are exactly the same, the eyes, the nose, mouth, ear, the neck, the bust line, exactly the same the caps, the poles, and the hair are different. Um, but these were produced from a hub. These were produced from a hub that like I showed you. So where did that come from? This is a 1792 dime pattern, Liberty Parent of Science and Industry. It's got an eagle on the back because it's a dime and that's the way they spelled dime at the time, D-I-S-M-E. We look at the half cent next to it, Boy, those faces sure look a lot alike, don't they? And when I overlaid them, yep, the faces are exactly the same. The eyes, nose, mouth, chin, cheek, neck, bust, exactly the same. So the same hub that made the 1792 dime was used to make the 1793 half cent. And that's a picture of what it probably looked like. We uh, don't know what the hair area looked like, so I've just graded out. So how do people collect half cents? Um, several ways. One is to simply get one example of the series. That's the easiest and the cheapest. If you want to get an uncirculated coin, you can get one, like I said, for a couple hundred bucks. 
a type set, six or eight coins, but one stopper. I showed you the type set earlier. Um, depending on how you decide to define the type set, it would be either six or eight coins, but one stopper, and that's that 1793. That costs a lot of money. A date set is 32 coins, but there are a couple of stoppers, 1793 and 1796. A variety set, there are officially 99 varieties in the canonical set, what most people consider to be the set. You can also collect die states of individual varieties. And as far as I'm concerned, it's your set and it can be anything you want it to be. Um, you don't need to try to get every one. You don't need to try to get even every type. It's your coin collection and it can be anything you want it to be. It's for your pleasure, not for anybody else. But I want to talk briefly about varieties. Uh, spend a couple of minutes on it and then we'll have some fun. These are three different 1797s. You can see the heads look about the same. Um, they're all red book varieties. The first one is called the one above one, also called a C1 or Cohen one. The middle one is the normal head, Cohen two. And the third one is the low head or Cohen three. You can pretty easily see why those are named the low head because the head is really low in the field. The uh, uh, one above one because there's a one above the one in the date. And the normal head is really a very, very pretty coin. Uh, long dentils, the head is beautifully centered and beautifully engraved. Um, I think that's the nicest uh, Liberty Cap half set, that 1797 normal head or Cohen two. Those are all red book varieties. In 1794, there were two different kinds of edge varieties, what they call large edge letters and small edge letters. You can see if you look at these that the lettering is bigger on the large edge letters than the small. But if you're just looking at one coin, um, you can still tell them apart. And the way you can tell them apart is to look at the word hundred. In the large edge letters coins, the word hundred is fairly closely spaced and the letters are evenly spaced. In the small edge letters, the letters are very widely spaced, especially R, E, D, look at the space between R and E, it's huge. So even if you look at uh, just one of these coins, you can tell whether it's a large letter or a small letter, and it's not hard. And by the way, thanks to uh, Tony Butcher for making these uh, photographs of the edge lettering. The lettered edges are only on 104 grain coins. How were the edges lettered? Uh, they used an upsetting mill, sometimes erroneously called a castang machine, um, that uh, had two thin dies, each with half of the edge ornamentation, or if the edge is to be plain, nothing. One of the dies moves by a crank and the coin rotates between them, uh, getting the ornamentation and becoming perfectly round. And this is a picture of, a, of an upsetting mill, uh, not a castang machine. This is one that is in the ANA Museum. And uh, I believe it was actually made by the ANA or for the ANA. So this is a modern example, but you have the hand crank that moves the long die and then the other one sits still and each one imparts half of the edge device. So let's look at a little bit more complicated varieties. Uh, these are three 1809s that are the three different red book varieties, the normal date, in this case, a Cohen three, the circle in O, Cohen four, and the nine over inverted nine, or Cohen five, which is actually not an inverted nine, it's just a repunched nine, but nobody seems to know that. So here are the three different red book varieties, um, but you wonder where are Cohen one and two and it turns out there's actually also a Cohen six. So there's six varieties of 1809. Watch what happens to the two coins on the right. Notice that that's a normal date, Cohen two, and a normal date, Cohen six. So there are three different, actually you'll see four different normal date coins. 
And you can tell these three apart. The uh, Cohen three, the lowest lock of hair is entirely over the zero in the day. The other two, it's between the zero and the nine. And you can tell those two apart because the C2, the date is pretty straight and the C6, the date is quite curved. Hope everybody can see the differences to see how those are. And now of course you're thinking, well, we're up to five varieties, but I told you there were six and we haven't talked about Cohen one yet. If you talk, uh, Cohen one uh, has a different reverse from Cohen two. So the C2 obverse comes with two different reverses. The C1, the leaf tip is right under the second S in states. In the C2, it's just past it. The C1 is actually a fairly scarce coin and uh, people actually still cherry pick that. So why do you collect varieties? First of all, it can be fun, educational and challenging. It can be an intellectual challenge. You can cherry pick rare varieties, especially when they're similar to common varieties. Knowledge is the king and the queen. Low heads are scarcer and more offense, expensive and not everybody uh, attributes those. 1809 C1 is still quite scarce, scarce and still cherry picked. Here's an interesting half cent. It's only got 12 stars, uh, five on the right side and seven on the left side. This coin is an AU, although it now resides in a mint state slab. Uh, it was AU when I owned it. So why does it have only 12 stars? Well, I don't know. Uh, the people that write about this say there wasn't room for the engraver to put another star in it. But if you watch by the bottom right, between the eight and the 12th star, they could easily have put that 13th star in there. Now you might say that that's a little close to the date, but it wasn't any closer than in 1809 and that one has 13 stars. So the question is, why did they make it with 12? And I have to say, I don't know. There's what it would look like with 13. That's what it really looked like. There has to have been a reason that they made that that way. We just don't know what that reason is. So let's look at a couple of die states. Here's a spike chin, a famous red book variety. It's called the spike chin because if you look at the chin, you see this spike sticking out of it and you see a little tongue coming out of Liberty's nose or out of Liberty's mouth rather. And uh, there are some curved lines in front of the neck. Um, it's believed that a small bolt fell on uh, one of the planchets and it uh, got punched into the die, we don't really know. But if you look at the reverse above the ME, you see that there's a cud forming, a, a die break in the periphery. We'll look at a slightly later version of that same coin. That ME cud is now over MERI and part of C. And there's another cud over the UN and a big crack under 200. Still later, that uh, uh, cut on over UN is now over UNI and under 200, and the cracks over MERI now uh, go over all of America. And this is the final version of, of uh, what it looked like when they finally got rid of the dye. But uh, one of the Authors that wrote about half cents, Walter Breen, said that there was also coins that had a die break over of, and, uh, of America. And so, but nobody ever saw one. So a collector had some of them made. And this is a fake that was uh, a die state that doesn't really exist. Kind of a fun thing. This is the real terminal die state. Uh, here's another example of die states that's pretty cool. Uh, this coin is a 1797, one above one, uh, one of the very finest known. This is an early die state, and this is a late die state. Look at all that. Actually, it's kind of a middle die state. It's not even a particularly late die state. But look at all that cracking and shattering all over the place. I've 
got red arrows pointing to all of the individual cracks. There's nine of them. The blue arrows point to a couple of, uh, of uh, places where the die has buckled. So there are raised lumps there. And the brown arrow looks at, looks at something that looks like an X over to the left of the date. Um, that X that looks like another die crack or, or some type of damage is actually under type. It actually is uh, struck over the, the uh, rigging of a ship like you see here. And that ship was a token, a Talbot Allen and Lee token. And uh, Talbot Allen and Lee was a company in New York that ordered all these tokens and then went belly up and sold the tokens to the mint. And they then cut them down and used them to strike half cents. Here's some other interesting half cents. Uh, some that I really think are cool. This is an 1809 that was struck about 30 or 40% off center. I love this coin. This is called a brockage, uh, a full reverse brockage. Um, when this coin was struck, another coin was laying on top of, of, of the die. And so you've got on one side, you've got the die striking the coin. That's the, the side you see on the right. And on the left, you've, you've struck the coin into the other blank. And so you have an image of what the die looked like. This is interesting because it's stemless and that die was used for three years. So we don't even know what year that was made. And here's one of my all time favorites. This was an 1808 half cent. It was rolled out at the ANA in Detroit in 1994 as a souvenir. This is, this is still one of my favorite half cents in my collection. But it's your collection, so collect them any way you want. And that's uh, what I'm going to leave you with. If you want some further reading, uh, the uh, numismatist from last November um, had an article by me about the uh, half cent typesets, and you're, and you're welcome to get that. And I did publish this book, The Half Cent, uh, 1793 to 1857, The Story of America's Greatest Little Coin. And I will just put in that very quick, uh, um, shameless uh, promotion. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and if I can. Let me see. Stop sharing my screen. Here we go. There we go. And uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Spalling versus corrosion on a die in the 1793 question mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. There are lots of times that people talk about die rust. Um, you'll see that in lots of writings by different people. Um, it looks like little raised spots all over the coin randomly. Um, spalling is a general term that refers to any type of, of uh, mechanical damage to the surface of a die, or it doesn't have to be a die. Other things can get spalled too. Um, uh, that spalling can happen as a result of mechanical damage, mechanical stress. For example, striking the coin is, puts a great deal of stress on the dies and, uh, and they can wear. And, and particularly in the early days of the mint, the die steel was not the best. And uh, so the dies deteriorated fairly quickly. Um, the reason that the deterioration in the 1793s cannot be rust, ooh, bless you, is that, <laughs> that must have been me, is that, uh, that uh, uh, you see the appearance of this kind of spalling or this kind of damage on a die uh, within one day. It's used during, during one day and you see those raised pits forming and that simply cannot happen due to rust during one day. Mm -hmm. And when they put them away at the end of the day, they covered them heavily with grease to protect them from the atmosphere. So th these dyes just didn't have time to rust. Okay, uh, next one. I am a beginner. This is all new to me. How much was that coin originally worth that was flattened in the coin roller? 
<laughs> well, you mean how much would it have been worth? Uh, in, in the condition it's in, it would probably be a, you know, the condition that it was in when it was rolled, it would probably be worth 75 bucks today, maybe a hundred. Oh, well. The guy that had it done could afford it. <laughs> uh, next one. Beautifully done. The Cohen numbers are still standard for variety collectors. What about Eckberg? Um, my note, I, I did use numbers as well. Um, I, I used a different way to do it. Colonial coin collectors refer to their varieties as a, uh, a letter and a number, uh, a number for the obverse and a letter for the reverse. So the first variety would be 1A. And, uh, and, and I used that convention um, when I wrote my book, uh, largely because uh, Cohen's um, emission sequence is wrong in many cases. And I just didn't want to give the impression that, that, uh, that, that you know, Cohen one through five were struck in order of one through five because they, they probably weren't. And that's why I use different numbers. I don't expect that people will adopt those simply because the uh, Cohen numbers have been in use for so long. He's also the guy responsible for us having the misinformation that only 1,390, 1,796 half cents were made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No misinformation spreading. <laughs> how, is the, <laughs> how is the circulated proof distinguished from the business strikes? Uh, in that particular case of the coin I showed you, it's easy because that year they didn't make any business strikes. That was in 1846 and all they made were proofs that year. So if you have a circulated 1846 half cent, it started out life as a proof. Okay. Uh, my red book has 1797 with lettering edge and gripped edge. Is one of these the wide hundred and the other the narrow? The no, the the, the letters are on the 1796s are different. Um, actually, I could show you if if you're really interested in that. Hang on, let me find that picture. I actually have one. These were only in the low head low heads. Uh, these are thinner planchets because they were at 84 grains instead of 104. And so to put the lettering on, if you look at the one on the left, it says 200 for a dollar, but the lettering doesn't really fit. Uh, the coin is too thin for the lettering. Um, most of the 1797s, even most of the ones that are low heads have plain edges. The other one is a, what's called a gripped edge and that's really very rare. There's only about 30 known of that. And uh, uh, nobody has the slightest idea why they did that, why they made that. But because uh, it, it was done in the upsetting mill, it had to have been edge dyes that produced that. Why they did that, again, is anybody's guess. <laughs> I have no idea. And next but one. it's fascinating. <laughs> yes. Uh uh, can you discuss the many years when half cents were not minted? Yeah, um, they didn't make any in a number of years. Um, 1801, for example, uh, there were none that were dated 1798 or 99. Um, they didn't make any from 1812 through 1824. And they didn't make any uh, for circulation from uh, 1836 through 1848. Uh, the basic reason was that um, half cents were not super popular. Um, um, it, you could, uh, you, you know, they, they just weren't something that a lot of people wanted to have all the time. Uh, there was even one year when somebody ordered 400,000 of them from the mint for the purpose of melting them down, probably to make roof nails. Oh, wow. uh, so uh, they just melted them down for the copper. So, the, there, there were times when the mint had a lot of them on, on hand, particularly uh, in, after 1811, they had a lot of them in stock and they, you know, people asked for them, they would pay them out and then eventually they started making more. Okay, last one, I think. Where do you stand on 1831 business strikes? Are there any? My opinion is no. My opinion is that at one time there might have been 
but I do not believe that any exist today. Um, there, there is no official report by the Mint that any were delivered. Um, there is no official report by the Mint. Um, the, the Mint says that 2,200 of them were, were made, but it doesn't say that they were dated 1831. They could have been something else. Um, if they made such things, they probably melted them down and used them for alloy with silver and gold coins. Okay, one more. I lied. Sure. <laughs> uh, the 1837 half cent token, really a hard times token, but often included in half cent collections and listed in the Red Book? Question mark. That's true. Um, I, I don't have a picture of one. Um, I, I should have uh, had a picture of one for this. Uh, but yeah, there's a token uh, that was part of the hard times token series. Uh, it says half cent of pure copper and it's got a wreath on one side. It's got um, an eagle on the other side. It doesn't look like a half cent, but it's uh, it's made to the specifications of a half cent. And people do collect them along with the half cents. I, I used to have one myself. So um, it's a very common thing for people to collect. There's a lot of them, so it's not hard to find. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions. So thank you very much. That was a very educational presentation. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did as well. And uh, thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.